Hello guys, so this is our third module for our uh, Science, Technology, and Society class. Okay, so the title of our module is Critical and Impact Analysis of Science and Technology. So basically, the problem question that we want to address for this specific module is this. What insights generated by our explorations are most worthwhile in understanding the promises of science and technology in promoting the present and future well-being of Filipino communities? So there are three subtopics under this module. We have science, ethics, and ecology. We have impact assessment of technology and critical analysis and future of science and technology. So for this specific sub-module, the topic is ethics and ecology of science and technology so just like any type of profession or social role scientists technologists and academicians have ethical standards ethical standards is a guideline of how certain professionals should behave in society when they are performing their roles in order for us to know whether their action is good is bad is appropriate or acceptable so there are actually four ethical standards for scientists that are common across all disciplines the first one is that scientists follow universalism so what is universalism universalism is the belief that there is only one truth and there is only one way to establish this truth and that method is called the scientific method so it doesn't matter if you are a social scientist or a physical scientist a chemist a physicist or a life scientist um, we are able to come up with new evidences with a general method and that is the scientific method which we discussed in the first module the next ethical standard for scientists is communitarianism. This means that scientists identify themselves as members of a community of scientists with a common goal and conscientiousness in line with the standards of their fields. So in short, as scientists, they are asked to integrate themselves within that community, to communicate with other scientists within their field, to present their evidences, to be ready for their evidences and their findings to be critiqued by this community in order for the discipline to flourish. The third ethical standard for scientists is skepticism. So scientists suspend their opinion and will only express it when all data are collected and analyzed through a neutral and objective process in accordance with the standards of logic and rationality and, of course, the scientific method. To further illustrate this standard, I would like you to remember the film and the band played on. So if you remember, before they were able to publish anything concrete about what they know about HIV and AIDS during that time, they really had to go through a lot of studying, a lot of contact tracing, a lot of debates within the team even. They challenged each other's positions. They also inhibited from making any pronouncements to the public uh, or the department of their findings unless they were really sure about the numbers and the connections that they were making because, you know, they're, they're the scientific community and their findings will be the basis for policies and for programs that the Ministry of Health will be done in the country so they were very careful they were very skeptical of even of their own work and the last ethical standard for scientists is neutrality neutrality means that scientists uphold the value of neutrality and objectiveness in their research so as much as possible they remove all the potential sources of bias they locate where subjectivity could be sourced from and they try to eliminate it as much as possible and probably when you go from one discipline to another, you will be able to find more nuanced ethical standards, more specific ethical standards that are appropriate or specific and contextualized to the discipline of interest. Like for example, if you're talking about medicine and life sciences, you would have an extra ethical standard on the right to life, respect to the dignity of living creatures. Or if you are a behavioral scientist or a social scientist, 
scientist, then you would have an additional ethical standard on you know respect for human dignity, respect for consent, etc., etc. But these four ethical standards, these are ethical standards that encompass all disciplines of science technology. However, it is important to note that ethical standards could be flawed at times. Ethical standards sometimes do not embrace context, that ethical standards could be problematic at times. And it is important that when we see ethical standards, we kind of question and we kind of unpack them. Where do they come from? What are the possible consequences of being very strict uh, in following these ethical standards? And also, are these ethical standards even realistic? And so we go to a higher level of ethical analysis we call philosophical ethics, which is concerned with the analysis and evaluation of normative standards or of the ethical standards themselves. So, appealing to philosophical ethics, let's ask the following questions. First, should scientists uphold universal knowledge all the time? Is there a potential problem when we allow scientists and the scientific community to dominate knowledge generation and say that this is the truth and this is the universal truth. Now, one potential problem that I see there is that it invalidates indigenous knowledge. And when we invalidate indigenous knowledge, there is a lot of cultural knowledge that is lost along the way. Next, should scientists limit their standards to those defined by their discipline? And obviously the answer here is no, not all the time should we allow ourselves to be constrained within our own discipline. Now, more and more every day, we see scientists collaborating with other disciplines and also collaborating with the community that they're doing research on. And I think that's very important for us to be able to increase the potential of the knowledge that could be produced because it is informed by different sectors of people. Question number three. Is skepticism among scientists good? And I would say generally, yes. The only problem that I see here is that sometimes skepticism is stretched to the point of conspiracy theorizing. Yes, and this type of skepticism is the one used by anti-vaxxers, by flat earthers, by climate change deniers, and those who say that COVID-19 is a bio-warfare thingy, which of course, it's not necessarily untrue. But, you know, too much skepticism on that area drives us away from the focus that we need to find cure and we need to find uh, and learn about the characteristics of COVID-19 in order for us to be able to control it. So yes, that could be some bad effects of exaggerated skepticism. Next and final question, is science neutral? And of course, the answer there is a big no. It's a no-no. And uh, we've had so many examples before how um, big companies try to skew findings and fund research that would support their products even if it's harmful to society. So uh, science is very, very far from neutral. Science is heavily politicized. Science is heavily social. Science is very heavily cultural. So science is not completely objective. It's, it's definitely biased to where the power structures are located. So probably majority of you, if not all, would agree with me if I say that science is not amoral, meaning science must be discussed in the context of whether what we're doing as scientists is immoral or what we're doing is moral or acceptable in society. Would it harm people? Does it potentially harm other living creatures? Would it potentially harm the environment? And here are some examples of some issues that scientific progress have had in that direction. 
So first, we have genetically modified organisms, and we encounter this on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, for example, we have the seedless grapes, we have the big apples, the very, very red apples, and generally fruits that take a longer time before they could go bad. And in order for us to achieve this, we have to genetically modify. Scientists have to, you know, tamper with genes, which of course invites the question, do human beings have that right or that privilege to really tamper with the nature of these living creatures? in order for them to have better you know, production and consumption of goods. Next would be artificial intelligence. And of course, we know that artificial intelligence is something that we already are experiencing in our life right now from the most mundane things that we do, like beautification of our selfies to more specific and more complex um, systems like military operations we have AI there and of course there are a lot of ethical issues that comes with the use of AI like for example a lot of people have been displaced because AI and robots have taken their job and some issues like the earlier versions of Siri there's a story that's that goes this way there was a man trigger warning so there's a man who was suicidal and he asked siri where's the nearest bridge i could jump to or jump jump from yeah and uh, of course siri heard the word bridge and so she showed him the nearest bridges in his vicinity and that's where he jumped and eventually died. And for these cases, who's accountable for the death? Is it Siri? Because Siri is not a real human being. She was just, you know, processing information that the guy, you know, inputted. But she was contributory to the death. So what's, where's the accountability in that? So these are some questions that we need to look into when we try to integrate AR, AI more in our lives. Next is animal testing, and animal testing has been very important in terms of drug development, cosmetics development, food development, etc., etc. And of course, there's that ongoing question, is it ethical to use animals for the use of humans? And uh, of course, you know, scientists have negotiated with, of course, advocates of um, of animal welfare that of course yeah we will do animal testing but we will make sure that during the experiments they are well taken care of etc etc but of course there's still that issue could science and technology introduce a way so that we will no longer have to do as much animal testing as we do now and of course we have other forms of medical progress. Um, we have so many technologies right now in terms of medicine that can extend lives and improve the quality of life. But of course, there are also medical treatments that we have to question, like for example, plastic and cosmetic surgery. I, I, these are elective surgeries. These are not necessarily life and death issues. But of course, there's increasing acceptance to plastic surgery, especially in certain countries like South Korea, because they believe that it improves psychological health you know, and social well-being. But is that enough? Um, justification for us to be able to tamper with the sanctity of human life. I'm not saying that I'm against it. I'm just giving the, the arguments that those who are not after or who those who don't agree with plastic surgery um, use. Um, next, of course, is we have reproductive technologies, which is, of course, forever, forever um, the debate that, you know, uh, the Catholic Church has with the states that allow, you know, reproductive technologies, including abortion. So these are medical advancements, and um, should they really just go unquestioned? So these are some issues that still plague science, technology development in the field of medicine. And of course, another detriment that science and technology has brought to this world is war, conflict. We know 
uh, that guns, tanks, military equipment, and military technology is all possible because of science. And we know a lot about um, countries that invest in research for nuclear energy. And while we believe that nuclear energy could be used for the good, it's so hard to not remember times where in nuclear power was used in order to, you know, eradicate, you know, lives, uh, millions of lives in the previous wars that we've had. And of course, it's hard to turn our eyes away from the effect of science and technology on the environment. Of course, we see it every day. It's very observable. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about the effect of science and technological advancements on the environment is climate change and global warming. We've seen the pictures of uh, ice caps melting. We see the videos of polar bears um, who, that are very frustrated because it's hard for them to thrive in those types of environment. We see uh, lands that are disappearing into the water because of um, increased um, sea level rise and a lot of science and technology is all about making use of natural resources converting natural resources and of course due to that we see forest degradation we see resource depletion and we see species going extinct extinct you know uh, we have decreased biodiversity and because of that there is a problem with the larger ecosystems. We see new types of diseases coming up because of the faulty ways that we are treating the environment and all for the name of science and technology and for human civilization. And of course another thing that science and technology has uh, done banned for the environment is that it increased consumption and when we have increased consumption we also have increased wastes production and we see a lot of videos about plastics being eaten by animals we see a lot of um, pictures of big dump sites and people living in these dump sites and we see um, interactions between countries and then the poor countries are being dump sites um, for larger countries and of course we can only expect this to go up you know and to worsen if we don't change our consumption behavior and our production behavior so going back to the main title of this class science technology and society let's ask ourselves how do environmental problems influence social inequality and there are two things to that um, social inequality worsens environmental problems and environmental problems worsen social inequality. So the first principle wherein uh, environmental problems are linked to social marginalization is resource capture, meaning environmental uh, degradation interacts with population growth to produce further social marginalization. Good way to illustrate this principle is making use of the concept of climate justice. So climate justice basically latches upon the idea that it is the developed nations, the highly developed nations that produce more uh, carbon emissions compared to other underdeveloped nations. For example, USA, France, and other European countries, um, they release more carbon emissions compared to probably the Philippines or Indonesia and other underdeveloped countries in the Southern Hemisphere. However, the countries that are impacted most by the ill effects of climate change are the ones that are found in underdeveloped countries. Philippines has experienced Typhoon Haiyan and other countries have also experienced, you know, tsunamis and super typhoons. However, these countries that are greatly affected by climate change are not the ones that contribute to the carbon emissions. So you can see the global social inequality here, right? So the highly economic and highly developed countries produce a lot of carbon emissions changes the atmospheric composition of the earth and then the effect of that impacts nations that don't have high economic status so that is why the climate change deal is very important because this is to make sure that those countries that produce 
most carbon emissions are the ones who would shell out more donations, more financial support, and more aid for those countries that are affected by climate change issues. So that's an example of how resource capture could be explained. Okay, so another principle that tries to explain how environmental problems influence social inequality is resource marginalization, which says that environmental degradation is an outcome of social inequality and population growth. So to illustrate this, let's think about why we have so much plastic wastes. And we know that the increased plastic waste is because of the continuous use of single-use plastics like plastic bags, uh, plastic bottles, or sachets. And we understand that this use of single-use plastics is highly related to consumption behavior. So we would hear people say, hey, in order for you to help the environment, instead of buying sachets, you should buy big bottles of shampoos instead because it produces less waste. However, that advice may not be applicable for those living in poverty who may not have the purchasing power to buy big bulks of materials or consumables and live day by day. And because there are more poorer people than richer people in society, we can expect that there would be more consumption of materials and products in single-use plastic. So there would be more plastic wastes because there would be more people who can only afford to buy things that are packed in single-use plastics. And then we also have this advice as why, well. hey, you should plant trees in your backyard. No. Only the rich people have backyards, so poor people who live in slums in very tight spaces wouldn't have any area for them to plant any form of shrub or tree or whatever. So resource capture and resource marginalization, they kind of are related to each other because one tells us that environmental degradation um, increases social marginalization and also social marginalization increases environmental degradation and therefore it's very important to note that um, while it is good for us to make all these interventions like hey let's use bamboo or metal straws let's make use of tumblers and whatever while they're good in and they're well intended i feel like we have to look into the more you know, root causes of environmental degradation and that is social inequality and um, an equal distribution of power and resources in society so in addressing issues on environmental problems social political environmental solution should therefore be based on two things first science and technology since environmental problems are technical problems and philosophy and ethics since environmental problems are moral and technical problems as well not only because it hurts other living things but also hurts human beings as well so there are two types of ideologies of environmentalism that could be used in order to address these problems. The first one is technocentric environmentalism, which posits that maximizing utility and economic benefits by creating sustainable technologies is a good way for us to solve environmental problems and makes use of high technologies. Examples of that would be solar-powered anything, solar panels, and probably electric cars. So these are... Uh, examples of uh, technocentric environmental solutions. The only problem here is that um, these are only accessible for the rich and for mega corporations. Next, we have ecocentric environmentalism, which posits that human beings must adapt and live in harmony with the environment instead of human beings trying to dominate the environment. Um, it posits that all forms of life are equal so we're not only doing these environmental solutions for humans to have a good quality of life but also to make sure that species continue to exist and this makes use of low technologies those that are found in indigenous communities and trying to harness their knowledge in terms of how they take care of their land and the environment that is available for them so in making environmental policies, um, 
these two ideologies, technocentric environmentalism and ecocentric environmentalism, could be used singly or in in collaboration with each other in order to address not only environmental degradation but also the social problems that are caused by environmental issues. So that's the end of our first lesson for this module. See you in a few days for our next lesson which is technological impact assessment.